Welcome back to Your Health Radio and Television Program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I'm a board-certified plastic surgeon, and I'm so happy you could be here with us. And I'm so happy to have as my next guest the illustrious, intelligent, hardworking <laughs> Dr. Nancy Rubin. Dr. Rubin, thank you so much for coming on the program. Well, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Dr. Rubin, you, and are, you are an oncologist, and I know you've got to be one of the hardest-working doctors on the staff here in Monterey. Seems like you live somewhere between your office and the hospital, <laughs> and I appreciate you coming on the program. Sure. So can we start off by talking about what sparked your interest in oncology? Like, why did you become a cancer doctor? Sure, sure. Well, um, as a lot of people on the peninsula know, I, I have a very good role model. My father's been an oncologist here for over 30 years, and so um, definitely I had exposure to oncology through him and growing up, um, going on rounds with him. But I actually initially was interested in sports medicine, and that's kind of where I was going with med school on my path. And I just, after doing rotations on oncology, I realized how rewarding it was and well, you know, how exciting the research is. And you know, as much as some patients don't do well, we have more and more patients who do do well, and it's great to be a support to those who aren't doing as well. And I just felt in the whole picture of medicine, it's really very rewarding. You know, very sad at times, but it can be a very rewarding profession to that is, that is true. D Dr. Rubin, let's go through and teach our, our listeners and viewers what your average day is like and what your average week is like as an oncologist. Okay, well I think most physicians, as you know, in general are getting busier and busier. But our day often starts out um, in the hospital and we have at Community Hospital, there's a whole ward dedicated to oncology patients. And so we often have a lot of inpatients either with active issues from their cancer, complications from chemotherapy. Um, and then also there's sometimes new consults in the hospital. So generally in the morning, you'll go to the hospital and round on all the inpatients and make sure they're doing okay, perhaps see some new consults. And then after that, um, occasionally also in the morning, there's um, meetings. We have a breast conference every Tuesday morning, and everyone just got to see Dr. Feehan, but the breast conference is with the radiation oncologists, surgeons like yourself, and the medical oncologists for us to discuss um, complicated cases. Right. And so I, I just want to make something clear to our audience. So when you say we make rounds, what that means is that we visit our patients in the hospital, correct? Right, So right. we can go room to room and see their charts and check with the nurses, et cetera. Right, right. So if we have a patient we're taking care of outside the hospital, it's really nice and comforting for them to know that if they end up in the hospital, they're going to have a familiar face looking over them and taking care of them. Right. So, so Dr. Rubin, you also go to your office, of course. Right. So you see patients in your office and you also see your patients in the hospital. Right, right. right. So the, the morning, just sort of early morning in the hospital, and the majority of the day is actually spent in the office, um, seeing patients in the office. Okay. And that's because luckily most of the patients are not in the hospital. They're, <laughs> they're able to be outpatients. Right. So I think it's a trend, uh, and, and please correct me if that's incorrect, that there's a trend towards doing as much as we can as an outpatient treatment or, or on an outpatient basis. In other words, to have the patient not sleep, be sleeping in the hospital overnight. Isn't that correct? That is very correct. And we do have an infusion center in our office where we give the majority of chemotherapy. If somebody gets dehydrated, we can give them hydration. We can give some antibiotics at times. And really, we keep most of the chemotherapy as best we can out of the hospital setting and give it in the outpatient setting. Well, yeah. Dr. Rubin, of course, that leads me to my next question. Can you try to teach our audience about chemotherapy? I think there's lots of misconceptions about what chemotherapy is. I think most of the public, when they hear chemotherapy, they think of people losing their hair and getting, getting some medicine in their vein as kind of ill-defined. Can you teach us a little bit about what chemotherapy is? Sure, sure. And chemotherapy has come a big way in the last 30 years. And we've got easier drugs. We've got excellent premedications to prevent a lot of the side effects from chemotherapy. So pretty much a typical patient getting chemo chemotherapy, let's say, uh, for example, a lung cancer, will come in and before they even get chemotherapy, we'll give them medications to prevent nausea, one of the more common side effects. And um, then after that, through an IV, they'll get their chemotherapy. It can be various different agents and the process can take as little as 30 minutes to as much as, um, you know, five or six hours, depending on the chemotherapy. But pretty much you're sitting in a comfortable chair does not hurt while it's going in. It's almost like getting a fluid infusion. And you can be sitting watching TV, um, reading books. A lot mm -hmm. of people work on the computers these days. But um, the actual day of chemotherapy is somewhat eventful. And what chemotherapy is, it's a drug that goes into your body and recognizes these ugly cancer cells as these fast 
dividing cells. They're not like the typical cells, and it can interfere um, you know, at different parts of the cell cycle, sort of attack, attack these cells that shouldn't be dividing as quickly as they are. So because of that comes some of the bad side effects, such as um, low blood counts, since there's fast-growing cells in your bone marrow. A lot of the chemotherapies, you do lose your hair, since the hair is a fairly fast-growing cell. Um, but again, with the new chemotherapies and some of the new supportive care we have, meaning the drugs to help get through chemotherapy, it can be somewhat uneventful. I don't want to promise that, but I do have some patients right. who've been able to work full time. Well, excellent, and great. So, so oftentimes, I mean, you try to encourage people to continue with their life as much as possible. Right. Well, Dr. Rubin, um, you know, breast cancer has been in the news lately. I mean, almost every day you can, you can barely turn on the television or pick up a newspaper without hearing about a screening test or a mammogram or breast cancer recommendations, and the same as pap smears. Now, can we talk a little bit about women's cancer and women's oncology? I know you have an interest in that. Right. Well, absolutely, and I think definitely I've got to comment on what's going on with the recent task force recommendations because I know almost every single patient has been bringing it up. And um, for the viewers out there, just within the last couple weeks, a big article was in the local paper, the New York Times, talking about a new recommendation for screening mammograms, which is quite a change. And, and this is kind of a, a long debate that's been going back and forth for the last 30 years about when's the optimal age to start a screening mammogram. And up until now, the most recent recommendation since 2002 is to start at the age of 40 um, with yearly screening mammograms. And there's strong family history. At a young age, you start 10 years um, younger than that, the, the person who got the breast cancer. So the latest recommendations from the task force are now saying there's no survival benefit, benefit to start screening between the age of 40 and 50. Mm. And they're recommending we start at the age of 50 which is coming to, it's a big shock to a lot of women. Um, and just sort of pulling everyone in the office, we've been discussing about it, you know, who is the task force, who are these people, and who they aren't. They're not oncologists, and there was no radi radiologists. Um, that's different than a radiation oncologist, but the people actually review the mammograms on that panel. And, um, you so know. It, it's, excuse me, it seems, if we're gonna say, let's start to screen, screen women at age 50, it seems rather unlucky for the woman who is 40 or 45 that may get a breast cancer and it's not picked up by mammogram. Isn't that right? Right, right. And as an oncologist, I'm going to have a very skewed view because I see all the young women who get diagnosed. But so their defense to that is that the women in, that at a younger age don't have a survival benefit of their breast cancer being picked up early. We know as oncologists that that just doesn't make a lot of sense to us. The, with breast cancer, unfortunately, it's the younger women who have the more aggressive cancers. Mm -hmm. um, before you go through menopause, there's more estrogen in your body. And breast cancer, 80% of the time, is estrogen-driven, meaning your body's making estrogen, and these receptors on the cancer cells feed on it, and the tumors can grow quicker and more rapidly. There are estrogen-negative tumors, and those can happen in young women, too. A lot of the genetic tumors happen in younger women. And so as an oncologist, we definitely feel that 40 to 50 is a pretty crucial time to get screened because if a cancer is picked up, it could be a more serious and a more aggressive cancer. I see. So those screening recommendations that recently came out, to say the least, they're controversial. E extremely controversial. And um, a lot of the doctors aren't in agreement with them. And they're not, I don't want people to think that's the new standard because it's not meant to be a new standard. It's, if anything, a, a recommendation mm -hmm. that a woman can
receptor in simple terms. And if a tumor has that growth receptor, there is now a pill for lung cancer called Tarceva, and it's part of a whole field of new therapies called targeted therapies. And these therapies can latch on to this targeted area on a lung cancer um, and then spare a lot of the other side effects that perhaps a chemotherapy could have and, you know, very good outcomes. And we found that especially in Asians, women, and non-smokers, that particular population, they are potentially going to respond to Tarceva, this pill, much better than they would chemotherapy. And so the young Asian woman who happens to get lung cancer, never smoker, she may actually get a pill as first line treatment. Whereas your um, older man smoker who probably does not have this receptor that we can test for is going to get a, a chemotherapy regimen. In that realm, we now can, by pathology, tailor the chemotherapy because there's data to show us which drugs work better for which a type of pathology, which um, this is all kind of new within the last year. So rather than sort of having a standard therapy for everyone, it really now it matters if you, there's two lung cancers, small cell and large cell, but of the large cell, the special types really matters because we can tailor our therapy. So it's um, leading to more effective treatments, less side effects, and just kind of a real exciting time in oncology. Well, right. that's excellent, Dr. Uwe. And you know, I love these segments where I learn a lot and <laughs> not just that we're educating the public because this is very helpful for me. So I started off by saying, uh, of course, men and women get some different cancers, but some cancers both genders can get. Now, would you treat a lung cancer in a woman differently than in a man, or it's just subtypes can occur in women and those same subtypes can occur in men? Um, it, it depends more on the path pathology. Um, there is some data that estrogen may drive some of the lung cancers in women, which they're sort of exploring just on a, on, on a side. But Again, the treatment, I think, is more based on these markers now, the EGFR marker, which is more likely to be positive in a woman non-smoker than a man. Um, but otherwise, you know, somebody who has a positive EGFR receptor or an adenocarcinoma, that type of pathology, man or a woman would get the same chemotherapy. I see. And, and one thing for the audience is chemotherapy, they think, oh, how can a woman and man get the same type of chemotherapy? It's all dosed on your height and weight, so a tiny woman is going to get a much smaller dose than a you know, 250 pound man. And so the chemotherapy is dosed you know, based on height and weight. Okay, so, so there's another issue or another principle that I think we can, we can emphasize is that chemotherapy is a hugely broad class of drugs, right? right. There, there's right. not just one chemotherapeutic agent. There, it's not just Taxol or 5-FU, et cetera, right? Now, right. doesn't the modern oncologist, don't you have a huge spectrum of medicines and chemotherapeutic agents to choose from, depending right. on the tumor type and where it is, and et cetera? Can right. you talk about that for, for, for a couple of minutes? Like, how do you choose the proper chemotherapeutic agent? Right. right. Well, each cancer has sort of its standard chemotherapies that we use. And um, it's all based on large studies that have been done where they found, you know, based on sort of a mouse studies or, you know, preclinical things, what drugs are going to work, those drugs then get sort of um, passed down to larger studies, studies dealing with patients. And through these big groups of data, we, ended up, we end up with a standard of care in which chemotherapy for which tumor is most effective. And there's, you know, guidelines for us to follow. Um, you know, a committee member that reviews all the data and sort of puts together the guidelines for each tumor type. There's always nuances with these guidelines, and every person, you know, has their own journey and their own course with cancer. But, you know, the treatment for breast cancer is going to be different than lung cancer, but then some drugs do overlap. Um, the treatment for colon cancer, a lot of women say, how come my friend didn't lose her hair when she got her treatment? You know, for colon cancer, you don't lose your hair with a lot of the, the drugs we have, whereas Unfortunately for breast cancer, since it affects women, um, the majority of the time they do lose their hair with a lot of the treatments for breast cancer. Um, I understand. So, so Dr. Rubin, l let's take a clinical example. L let's say someone's diagnosed with colon cancer. And of course, women can get colon cancer as well as men. Now, as an oncologist, you'll see a patient in consultation. And how do you come up with recommendations regarding surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, in other words, I think that you, and I know you do, and I, I greatly admire what you do, and I know how well you take care of your patients, but how do you custom design a therapeutic regimen for each patient? 
Is it based mm -hmm. on the, the tumor type, the pathology, their age, where the tumor is located? I mean, how do you go about that? Right. It sounds so, I mean, it seems so complicated to a plastic surgeon, and I'm sure to the public, they're, they're confounded. I mean, they're dumbfounded. Right, right. Well, the, the most important thing when you're making a treatment plan for a patient is what stage is their cancer. And all cancers are stage, stage one through stage four. Stage one is an earlier stage cancer that luckily can be cut out. Stage two is also an earlier stage cancer where um, it can be cut out, but potentially you're going to need further treatment. Stage three is where oftentimes we bring a whole team together and we're figuring things out. Um, in the case of colon cancer, though, that's often made after surgery and it just means a certain amount of lymph nodes were involved. And a stage four cancer means, you know, that's out of the initial area. So for an example of colon cancer, a tumor that started in the colon has spread to the liver or the lungs or bones. And a stage four patient, unfortunately you can't cure them, but in today's day and age you can definitely prolong their life and every year it seems longer and longer and you know what once carried a prognosis of less than a year, we've seen people five years or more with stage four disease. So in stage four, sometimes surgery is part of the plan. If somebody has a very large mass and it's giving them problems, even though we can't cure them, at some point you may want to take that mass out to cause, you know, to keep them from having problems. But the most important thing is to get the cancer under control, and often we'll start with chemotherapy to try to shrink the cancer down. And there are some different regimens as well as targeted therapies. And so you look at a patient's health and what are their major problems. And if somebody's got a lot of what we call heart disease or strokes, one of our great drugs, Avastin, which I think probably everyone's heard of, one of the targeted therapies, is not so good if you've got a lot of coronary artery disease. Um, whereas there's another drug, Herbitex, another targeted therapy, which can cause a rash and um, sort of an acne type um, problem, which a younger woman might not like, or a salesperson who goes door to door. Mm -hmm. So you can really sort of tailor your therapy both on a patient, you know, how active they are right now. Do they want a rash, or are they okay to have an increased risk of a clotting event? So there are really nuances like that, if that's sort of what you're getting at. Well, Dr. Rubin, I, I must say I greatly admire uh, the advances that, that your field has made, and I admire the work you do. I know you try so hard for your patients, and you're one of the hardest working doctors I know. Um, if people have questions about, say, what's, what's on what, what can we expect in the future, or if they have questions about chemotherapy or different oncologic um, subjects, can they call the office, or is there somewhere they can go on the internet? Do you have you have an office here in town? Is that right, okay if we right. give out the number? Oh sure, yeah. Um, our our office number is three seven five four one zero five. We do have a website that is in the works. Um, uh, the name of the office is Monterey Bay Oncology, and um, and where's your office? It is Five Harris Court. Here in, in Ryan Ranch. Ryan Ranch. Yeah, okay. Ryan Ranch. So, Dr. Nancy Rubin, oncologist, your mm -hmm. specialist in cancer treatment, mm -hmm. 375 4105. Dr. Nancy Rubin, oncologist. Dr. Rubin, I really appreciate you coming on the program. Not yes. only I, I think we were able to teach the public, but the plastic surgeons learn as well. So, <laughs> thanks very much for well, being here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board certified plastic surgeon, and this is Your Health Radio and Television Program. We're going to come right back after a very brief pause for a very good cause.